been asked to uh, introduce myself, I would have been uh, one word, perhaps two words. Uh, the first word would have been, uh, I'm just basically a bullshitter. <laughs> the second word is, uh, I'm a good bullshitter. <laughs> You'll get uh, a sense of that as we get into. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I'm usually loud enough that uh, I don't need these things, but. <clears throat> um, thanks, Rob. Uh, let me sort of. Um, See if I'm technically competent enough to get this right. No? There we go. Um, the difference between, there's a difference between me and, and Edison. Um, he actually uh, knew what he was talking about, and, and this comment was made on his way towards um, developing a, a, a light bulb that actually worked. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not in that, in that same category. Uh, essentially because um, I don't consider myself to be an expert in, in the capital markets. I don't understand the industry jargon that I've listened to for the past uh, hour and a half. Um, and uh, while I've got strong opinions, and you'll hear those opinions, um, I really don't mind if you don't agree with me. Um, in fact, I couldn't care less if you don't agree with me. Um, but I certainly don't. I certainly don't mean to offend anybody, and, and clearly this is uh, a much more sophisticated uh, business than, than is apparent to somebody who's a layperson like me. So with that caveat, let me, uh, let me move on. Um, as Rob has said, uh, there's sort of a, a number of, of businesses that operate underneath uh, my sort of holding company, if you like, or our holding company. Uh, the first one is a public company. Uh, the other four, uh, or the second one, is is no longer with us, and uh, we sold it. And the other three, and a couple of others that I'm not going to mention here, are really where I spend uh, uh, most of, of my time, just given the na the nature of, of their development, and and really speaks to as I sort of get into these businesses and and talk to you about uh, the experience they've had in the in the capital markets. Uh, uh, I'll be making sort of a subtle point, which I'll try and make forcefully at the end, as to why I think Canada's capital markets are inadequate. Um, so this company began in the 1970s, um, as I say, with a shakedown of friends, literally $15,000, got this business off the ground. And, and uh, in those days, you know, finding $20 uh, for groceries on Friday, and you could buy a week's worth of groceries for 20 bucks. And, uh, in those days, um, uh, was fifteen thousand dollars that we raised from friends. Um, the company really struggled uh, to generate uh, credibility uh, within the with any kind of uh, financial institution, uh, just simply because um, we were operating in a in a very traditional industry and doing things which which the industry uh, was not doing, and, and that did not help our, our credibility, and, and we continued to be ignored and brushed off uh, would be a kind way to describe the, the sort of treatment we were given by uh, local financial institutions, and notwithstanding that, by the, by the early 80s, we had a business that was probably doing, I'm guessing, don't remember exactly, $40 million in sales. And we had an opportunity. The industry was changing, and you, you know, I'm a great believer in luck. Uh, frankly, and uh, um, and when you're when you're not a smart guy, it pays to be a lucky guy. So I always describe myself as a lucky guy. Um, and we were around at a time when the industry was going through some big regulatory transformation, and we're able to take advantage of that. And we needed some money to do a deal. In fact, we needed five million dollars, and that was the equity piece that we needed to get this deal done. And our biggest customer in those days was a was a UK uh, retailer called Marks and Spencer, and nobody really, and this market knew who Marks and Spencer was. And the private equity market says you, you won't remember because none of you were, very few of you were around in the early 1980s, really didn't, um, uh, the, the, the private, yeah, the PE, sort of as what we call the PE uh, industry, didn't really exist in those days. So finding $5 million in equity capital was very tough to do. Um, but we found it in the, in, uh, in the UK, and then uh, that, uh, investor sold out to a strategic investor in a year's time, and that was great because we had a great relationship for a number of years in, uh, uh, with that investor, and we ultimately bought that investor out simply because they had a minority stake and, and uh, 
um, their market didn't understand uh, why they had a minority stake in a Canadian company, and uh, and uh, we ended up buying them out and, and going public in 2002 in the income trust market, and I'll come back to that. So, uh, you know, this company, um, uh, just to sort of fill you in uh, on what happened sort of post-2002, the first couple of years were good, and then the Canadian dollar went from from uh, obviously a huge discount to the U.S. to virtual parity in the course of two or three years, and we were an exporter with all our costs in Canadian dollars and all our revenues in U.S. Uh, uh, or basically U.S.-based dollars, and so that was a huge margin hit. I don't think we managed the company well through that transition, and so our IPO price went from ten dollars to I think a high of I don't remember what it was, but perhaps. Thirteen or fourteen dollars, all the way down to I think less than a dollar, and it's back now to um, I don't know what it is today, but probably seven or eight dollars, something like that. And the company's uh, being managed extremely well by a, a guy that we hired, uh, the family hired a few years ago to come in and and straighten the business out. So if I think sort of think back, so this company's got a a, a sort of market capitalization today of about let's say five hundred million dollars. So I think that's about right. And uh, what, what should have happened here is, is uh, you know, look, uh, you, you, you get money where you can find it. At least that's my experience sort of thing. And, and if I, the shame of it is that if I think about the Canadian institutional uh, community and their need to place long-term funds in very secure places over long periods of time for, you know, sort of a, a significant premium, let's say, to Treasury yields, given their liabilities, this would have been an absolutely great uh, opportunity for Canadian institutional money to own the licenses of, of this company, the licenses that essentially, I mean, it's a bit like a forest products company. You say, look, I don't want the risk of pulp prices, and I don't want to operate the pulp mill or the timber mill, so I'd like to own the forest product. I'd like to own the land, and I'll lease you, I'll sell you the timber rights on an annual basis, and, and maybe I get some, some kind of a premium based on market prices, so I get a base... I get a base price, and then I get I get some kind of earn-in, if you like, on uh, on what's happening in the market when the market's good. That's what should have happened to this business. This company should not have gone public. It should have stayed private, and it should have had, it should have found a big capital base in in the licenses. Um, and it's a shame that we weren't more engaged with the uh, Canadian institutional community to make that happen. Uh, this uh, company was started in the late uh, uh, 1990s, essentially to take advantage of something that um, most of you will not know. None of you will know this. That is that Halifax Dartmouth has the second, still has actually, second highest concentration of ocean-related PhDs in the world. And um, virtually all of these are working for some kind of a institution or government-sponsored um, research effort. And um, uh, we were intrigued at the prospect of, of sort of trying to make some money out of this huge intellectual uh, asset or property asset that we had in Halifax Dartmouth. And so we went looking for an opportunity and found it in the fact that there was a guy in Halifax, a um, very, very nice uh, uh, man. Um, uh, bless his heart, he's dead now. But in any event, he was Mr. Fish Oil, and he had written over 400 papers on the efficacy and integrity of omega-3 fatty acids. And something else everybody in this room should be doing is taking omega-3 uh, omega pills on a daily basis. It's a no-brainer. If you've listened to as many presentations as I have, I can promise you you'd be doing it. Uh, and from people who knew what they were talking about, not guys like me. So uh, initially, we funded this money from, from uh, or funded this company from uh, cash flow out of the seafood business, and I call this stupid bugger money because my management team hated me for doing this because this was money that was not available to them uh, to put into uh, the asset base of the seafood business. And as far as they was con concerned, I was squirreling it away. Um, we then uh, had to build a couple of plants, uh, one in South America and one in, in, in uh, Nova Scotia. And of course, that was easy. We got some uh, government um, uh, long-term debt for that. And then in, uh, I'm just trying to think when it was, about 2005, I think, or maybe 2006, uh, we sold a significant minority interest uh, to the Richardson uh, family to their private equity fund 
Um, and that was primarily, that happened because I happened to be a very good friend of Harley Richardson and I was an investor in the fund and, and so we knew each other well. And um, their, their duration of their fund was up in, in 2011 and we had to do something. And um, uh, so we sold the business in, in uh, 2012. And as I look back on the sale, and we sold it to a European multinational firm who, who will do a great job for the company. They've got international distribution. Uh, they've got customer relationships that we did not have. Um, but here's the point I want to make. Uh, w when we sold the business, we did what every seller does, w does, which is produce a prospectus document, which has got all kinds of, you know, the last few years are supposed to be like this, and of course what, what's happening in your forecast is all of a sudden they're heading up like that miraculously, right? That's what you want to uh, try to sell on. Well, in the year we sold the business, I think we did the, we agreed the deal in April or something, and the, and the company had a, had a calendar year end. The company actually beat its forecast uh, for that year. So the, we had a very happy seller, uh, sorry, very happy buyer. And, um, and incidentally, they've now gone on and doubled the plant capacity and the company's doing great. So, you know, to some extent you can say, well, this is sort of seller's remorse, we shouldn't have sold the company. But, but somebody made a comment earlier in one of the earlier presentations about we look for world platforms, we look for companies that really have something that is globally um, or competitive on a global basis and is really what I would call a platform company. A uh, company that's got an opportunity to do a lot of things on the basis of its core technology. This, this, this absolutely fit this company. This is a, this, this is what this company is inside this business, uh, and um, uh, we should we should not have have sold it. So how? So the challenge for me was, well, how do I find 250 million dollars to give the Richardson family uh, for their stake because they 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 sort of were out of the duration of their fund and, and they needed liquidity and, and still hold on to mine and I didn't have the, uh, the guts to do that myself and so I should have found an institutional investor in this market who would have come in and partnered with us. We'd have been quite happy not to sell. Uh, so this company started in, uh, um, in 2005 and it started as a consequence of a friendship between me and a guy who was, I had asked to serve on a board with me and, and this guy knew a great deal about the telecommunications cable industry. I knew nothing about it other than it appeared to me to be a pretty safe kind of business. You don't hear about many of these businesses going, uh, going bust. Uh, there was a famous fraud with a company called the Delphia Communications in the United States, uh, but none of the senior creditors lost money in, in that deal and you know, frauds happen. Uh, not all the time, but and basically the characteristics of the business are, are, are sort of a, a safe harbor, if you like, for capital, and it's a capital-intensive business. And um, so um, I remember um, uh, the company had been going for, I don't know, uh, some period of time, let's call it a year, and uh, I didn't know Michael. Um, I knew of him, and so I had, a, uh, both of us were boat guys, we both liked boats, so I had, we had, a, we shared a common boat broker, so I called my, my boat broker and I said, I want you to introduce me to this guy, Lee Chin, and he did, and um, so I went up and I said, uh, Michael, I'm going to give you a little presentation on this business and you should put $50 million in it, and, um, you know, that's a lot of money to ask a guy to put in a business the first time you, you ask, you, the first time you meet him. And um, anyway, he did in the end, and it turned out to be a great investment for him. And he got uh, taken out by this guy Malone down here. So then we sort of used pretty conventional financing. Uh, the company now has a, has a two and a half billion dollar balance sheet. So uh, you know, obviously, a lot of capital went into the business. Um, we did a bond sale in New York in 2009 when it was very, very difficult to do a bond sale. The capital markets were still very, very skittish in 2009 and there weren't a lot of public issues. And so the, the consequence of that is that as a first time issuer, uh, we, can, we had a covenant package which was like this thick and uh, paid a huge premium for the money, 11%. And we agreed to something that we should never have agreed to which was a five year duration, uh, you know, in a five year make all kind of thing. Um, and uh, we paid off those bonds um, a couple of months ago, and, and so everybody got 11% to maturity and, and with a premium at the end, obviously. So it was a great investment. I don't think we had any Canadian institutions in that bond, none. 
Um, the biggest holder was PIMCO. Um, second was somebody, I think, I think it was BlackRock, uh, Blue Bay uh, from the UK. Um, and the bond sale that we just did um, in March was uh, $1.2 billion. It was many times oversubscribed. Again, um, I think Manulife might have been there, but by and large, again, all the same investors we had uh, the first time around. And um, uh, obviously at a much more attractive interest rate. And, and some of that, I think, uh, helped. Uh, we're, we were helped by the fact that, uh, that John Malone, who's the sort of king of cable TV, um, came in uh, a year and a half ago and took out all our minority investors, including Michael. And um, uh, his sort of presence in the, in the company brought a level of credibility to the company that the company didn't enjoy. Everybody had heard of him. Nobody had heard of me. Um, and um, so that worked uh, well for us. So th this company is really doing uh, extremely well. I mean, this, this asset is a, is a crazy unique asset. I remember in 2008 and 2009, and there weren't a lot of nights that I got a good night's sleep in 2008 and 2009, I can tell you that. It was a scary time uh, and, uh, for me. And um, this business grew every week during that period of time. It added more customers every single week during 2008, 2009. I mean, you gotta say to yourself, how many companies grew absolutely every single week through this period? Just a crazy business. So, uh, and really, really well managed. I, I must tell you that I'm not the CEO of any of these businesses. I was with the seafood business for a long time, but I'm not, and, and so these companies have great management teams. And this company has obviously got a, a great uh, CEO. So what's going to happen to this company? That's a good question. Um, the problem is that the company is of a significant enough size now that it's of interest to some of the big players in the business. And, um, uh, and uh, management have some options. And again, the issue is how do you get, how do you get some liquidity back to people who've, who've created some real wealth through all the sweat they put into a business and still hold on to the company. That's a, a bit of a challenge. Um, but in terms of, of uh, my sort of attitude, I don't, I, I like this business. I would like this, my family to hold on to this business for the long term. I don't see ourselves as being, frankly, owners of ExxonMobil stock. Nothing wrong with ExxonMobil stock, um, but we're, this is the characteristic of the Characteristics of this business are, are very good, and we'd like to hold on to it for, for the long term. And it's just, the story is relevant because um, essentially all, this, uh, all, the, all the capital that this company raised, and everybody from both up and down the right-hand side of the balance sheet, whether it's being senior debt or, or equity, has done extremely well by this company. A lot of money and a lot of wealth is being created, and none of it Canadian other than Michael, but Michael might call himself sort of um, Jamaican Canadians, that's fair enough. Um, uh, this is a, a, a more recent startup. This company is, I'm trying to think now, it's about three years old, um, and uh, was actually uh, a brainchild of a, f a good friend of, of my son who um, I've known for a long time. The kid was an absolutely incompetent uh, chess and checker player, and my son, who's not much better, continued to beat him, and I can always made fun of the fact that, uh, but notwithstanding his incompetence at the games table, this kid is really, really smart. And uh, he came up with an idea for, again, uh, I'm gonna use this word platform software. So uh, the software essentially is sold into the telecommunications market to, to companies like Bell and Telus and Rogers and, Comcast and so on, and AT&T, and um, it's not sold in yet, but it's in the process. Of, it's, it's got two big customers. Uh, the company's already had, we put about, I'm just trying to think, ten or not, not as much as $15 million into this business, less than $15 million, of which we put in mostly all the money. And uh, we've already had a nine-figure offer for the company, which uh, I've turned down. And again, it, here's the challenge. The challenge is that that management were left with a significant equity stake in the business. And they're looking at, at the opportunity cost in their minds of sort of saying, hey, I've only worked uh, for a salary all my life. Now all of a sudden my options are worth, you know, in, in several cases, you know, seven figures or mid seven figures. And how do, I, how do I get some liquidity for that 
while we continue to develop a business which which could which has the prospects it's not yet but absolutely has the prospects to be a great company every single so this company now has two customers every single transaction think about this that in which the company interfaces with all its clients, doesn't matter where it's cell phone clients, TV, you know, broadband clients, cable TV clients, doesn't matter, goes through this company's software, for which this company is gonna get a toll. And <clears throat> you know how long the sales cycle is for these businesses? You know how, how hard it is gonna be for a customer to switch out of this technology? It's not gonna happen, right? Unless these guys screw up and they got a great team of people now. So my point is, the challenge is, how do you, fi how do you find an opportunity to keep this company in Canada uh, because this company has an opportunity to be, you know, something that we would all be very proud of? Um, um, this, is a, um, uh, this is a crazy company. Um, Mara is Gaelic for, for the sea or the ocean. And... Um, uh, we found, uh, back to the sort of the root of the science community in Halifax, Dartmouth, so omega-3 uh, fatty acids uh, don't come from fish. They do, but fish are the in intermediate product, uh, or the intermediary, if you like. They really come from algae, and fish eat the algae, right? All hydrocarbons are born in, in, in algae, right? Um, so oil and gas has really decomposed algae over millions and millions of years. So what we wanted to do was essentially uh, find a synthetic source of omega-3 fatty acids by finding an algal organism that was extremely prolific and then grow it, let figure out how to grow it intensively and create our own omega-3 fatty acids without having to go through fish. We could then control our costs and get away from the vagaries of the supply associated with, with the fishing industry in South America where most of the omega-3s come from. So that was the sort of genesis of the business, if you like, and then uh, we said, to hell with omega-3s, we want to, the op real opportunity here is in the biofuel uh, business. Um, and if we can get our costs consistent that, and the profile of, of the oil that this organism produces is, is ideally suited for the jet fuel market. And um, the jet fuel market is mandated now in, in most Western jurisdictions, certainly the U.S. Defense Department, which is the largest user of jet fuel in the world. All of these uh, businesses have a mandate, and there is nobody yet who has got a commercially available biofuel product, even at a significant premium to current oil prices. We think right now, so, we've, so let me tell you where we are. We put about $50 million of our own money into this business. That's you know, not an inconsequential amount of money. Um, and we've been working at this for about seven years. We have tested at, at commercial scale. Commercial scale is 200,000 liter batches. Uh, and uh, we want to go out and build a plant now um, that's going to cost 50 or 60 million dollars and I'm scratching my head as to you know wh what do I want to where do I want to raise that money do I want to write the check or do I want to bring in a partner just what do, what do we want to do if you like in terms of our, our our sort of capital exercise the reason I like this business model and and you know for those of you who see lots of deals and I see lots of deals um, and our list of startups goes on beyond this page, but uh, uh, it stops here kind of thing, is, is I, I, I focus now on business models that I, that I like. In other words, I don't, I don't want a business that I've got to put a whole bunch of capital in, and then, and then if it's successful, it needs, it's nothing wrong with Columbus, but I don't want another business that's going to consume a couple billion dollars of, of capital. I'm looking for business models that, that uh, are, are, are ones where where essentially you can lever uh, other people's capital. So I see this business as really a, a, an IP business. We're gonna license, the, so we're gonna build a commercial plant. It's gonna cost us 50 or $60 million. We're gonna show people what this plant can do and then hopefully we'll become a licensor of that technology and let other people who've got cheap sources of carbon, you need a cheap source of carbon to make this all work. But this, this company, in my opinion, has got more potential than all our other businesses put together. This, this, is, this, this could, and I say that because we've got a team of about 18 scientists in Halifax, and we've been at this now for seven or eight years, so we know what's going on in the biofuel space around the world, and we don't think anybody's got a bug as prolific as our bug. Um, 
we think we are ahead of the cost curve, uh, but th this will be a business in which there will be multiple winners. This isn't a winner-take-all thing. It's a bit like, you know, a guy's going to make money with an oil well if his costs of lifting the oil are $80, and the guy who's got an oil well where the costs are $50 is just going to make more. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay. So let me sort of try to uh, bring this all together in a, in a meaningful way uh, for you. Um, and just, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, I understand why Jim Flaherty, and, and look, I was a great friend of the guy. I think he was one of the best finance ministers this country has ever had, and, and it's a huge loss that we don't have him anymore. And I, I, I didn't like him for his decision to shut down the income trust market, but I did argue with him my thought that there was a better way to do it. I didn't think you had to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And the reason I liked the income trust market, not was because I thought that Bell Canada should convert into an income trust, and clearly that's why he had to shut it down. I get that. Uh, but this was a made in Canada capital market story, right? We had something that no one else had, and this was attractive to companies with market caps of 50 and 100 and 150 million dollars and 200 million dollars, which really could not get into the public capital markets other than through the mechanism that the income trust market provided. And when we shut, when we closed that door, we really shut the door on the public markets for these sort of small cap companies. And, and in my opinion, that's, that's tragic. So, um, uh, let me talk to you about uh, sort of my, my sort of sense of the importance of capital markets. And, and this is really sort of a 40,000 foot observation, if you like. Um, and I accept that some of you may not agree with me, but I don't, as I said, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> the United States has, has got, you know, I, I, I've got some great American friends, and, and, um, <laughs> but I love to criticize the United States. I think the United States has got a lot, uh, has got a lot of things going for it. Certainly it's got great institutions. Um, it's post-secondary education is second to none in the world. Uh, great rule of law. Uh, it's the world's reserve currency. I could go on and on, right? But it has the most robust capital markets in the world. There's absolutely no question. You can tell me about all the good things you're doing in Canada. Um, you know, look, I, frankly, I, you're not going to convince me. It has. The United States has got the most robust capital markets in the world, and that's hugely important, and it's hugely important because if you think about, just think about the S&P 500 today, right? And I don't know what the top, I could probably guess pretty accurately the top 10 companies and the top 50 companies, but you look at those companies, and, the, and all, virtually all the new ones are U.S. companies, right? All the new ones are U.S. companies. And you have to say to yourself, well, why is that? Are Americans smarter than everybody else in the world? I don't believe that for a minute. Huh. It's because they, they have figured out how to make their capital work, markets work uh, to support their, um, their, their, their high growth opportunity businesses. And I say that because, <clears throat> you know, we, we think, and, and I look, I know there's some exceptions in the room, and so I, again, I take my hat off to those exceptions that are in the room. But <clears throat> it's, people think that it's all about just the raising of the money. You know, you give them the money and off they go to the races. And the American pub, uh, capital markets understand, no, that's only a part of it, right? It's only a, only a part of it. And what you really need along with that, with that money is you need proper s sort of, not governance, because the, the implication of governance is a board of directors. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about mentorship. I'm talking about networking. I'm talking about, I'm talking about what I do, frankly, for all my CEOs, right? Which is to, I, it's just not being there on the other end of the telephone at 10 o'clock at night when they want to talk about a problem. It's about me proactively engaging with them, which I do on a very regular basis, about what's going on, talking about this, talking about that, helping them make up their minds, giving them the confidence to make their decisions, not making decisions for them, but guiding them in a, in a, in a way such that they can get, make sure they, they're, they're dealing with the appropriate facts and understand the risks and, and, and so on and making those decisions. And <clears throat> it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of friggin' time. I mean, I've got five startups and I work hard. I mean, I use my weekends to get caught up on email. I, 
I, I work hard. There are not a lot of people that put in more. Maybe I'm stupid and I'm not effective and I'm not efficient. I accept all of that, I accept all of that. But I still put a lot of hours in and I can tell you that 90% of those hours go, go into those five startup companies. So when you tell me you've got five people and you've got 100 companies in your portfolio, I say, that's bullshit because you're not spending any time with your businesses. You can't be spending any time with your business. That's not stewardship, that's not mentoring, that's not helping the businesses. Now, I suppose what you could be doing is sort of saying, okay, well, I'm gonna make sure that that CEO has got a proper network. But I, I know guys in the PE space and in the venture capital space in Silicon Valley and Chicago and New York and so on, you know. Uh, and I can tell you that the way they organize around the money that they invest in their businesses is exactly the way I'm organized around my startups. A partner has got responsibility for a business and he puts a lot of time into that business and, and stays very close to that, that, that CEO. And that's what helps those businesses, not because the guy's making the operating decisions, but because he's, he's helping and, and they bring their network to, 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 to bear and, and so on. So, What's my representation? I want to sort of wrap this up and, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions if, if, you, uh, if you have any. Um, the, um, I, I'm, I'm guilty here, I know of this, of, of sort of saying, okay, well, there's a problem, and you know, it, it, it's incumbent upon somebody to say, okay, if there's a problem, then what's the solution? And I'm not going to be an advocate of a, of a particular solution because I don't understand the regulatory environment. I don't really understand your business intimately enough to sort of tell you that there's, uh, what the solution is. But I'm telling you that there is a, uh, a problem because I don't care how big the Canadian private markets are at the moment. I'm telling you they could be a hell of a lot bigger. That's my point. They could be a hell of a lot bigger and, <coughs> and both from, from small investors and, uh, you know, look, I'm absolutely of the view that, uh, that you don't want, you know, somebody boring to put money into a company like Merrill Bio Biofuels and you don't want somebody who's got $200,000 worth of net worth putting $10,000 into, into a company like Mera. That's not what I'm s suggesting at all. Uh, and I, th and I, I think you get that. Um, but uh, uh, so let me give you some some observations. Uh, f first of all, regulations have real limits, and um, uh, you know the, the regulators. That's their job to regulate. So when there's a problem, they do what they think they have to do, which is impose more regulations. I mean that's why they're they're regulators. So it's pretty hard to sort of say to a regulator, your job is not to impose more regulations. My point is that. Regulations don't stop bad things happening. Right? Anybody who thinks that Hart Scott Rodino or the Volcker Rule is going to pre pre prevent a financial institution from failing in the future is is crazy. Right? Uh, it's it's regulations are not going to pr are not are not a, uh, a replacement for poor judgment uh, and and not a replacement for business cycles in which in which the weakest of a particular breed are going to get uh, left behind. Um, the second observation would be a point that Rob uh, made in his opening remarks, and that is it's character that counts. Um, you know, you can spend all the time you want due diligence um, a business plan and trying to, to, uh, to get yourself uh, up to speed, if you like, on the technology curve. Uh, I don't do that. I, I assess the individual. I, I know I'm never going to be smart enough to to uh, sort of query that individual on, on an area in which this, this person has perhaps put a lifetime as well as post-secondary education or a graduate degree into, into an art. And I'm trying to assess, you know, I'm trying to critically assess if this guy knows what he's talking about over the course of a two or three week due diligence period. I mean, give me a break, right? I mean, how many people are that smart? I, I'm certainly not that smart. So I figure out that my job is to assess that person. Is this person humble? Does he know that he can be wrong? Uh, has he understood the fact that there are risks and that you know the sort of road from here to here is full of bumps? Does he understand that the three-year business plan is toilet paper? When was the last time anybody in this room ever saw a three- or five-year plan actually come out the way it was, it was drafted? Yet people spend all their time looking at year three and saying, well, I don't know about these assumptions. It don't make any sense. What a waste of goddamn time, right? I can tell you right now the three-year part of the plan is bullshit. Probably the first year is bullshit too, 
<clears throat> just not the way, uh, the way things happen. And so, you know, are the people you're investing with, A, are they honest people? Are they going to tell you about problems early on? Are they going to disclose uh, those problems when there's still an opportunity to sort of sit down and collectively use everybody's uh, intellectual horsepower to figure out uh, what can we do about them and, and figure out another way? Because that's, uh, that's what building businesses is not about sort of starting here and, yeah, I'm going to get to that point. It may be that you're going to get to that point, but I can guarantee you you're going to take different roads than you ever believed was going to be the case in, in getting to, to, to that end point. So are these people, are the sort of people who, who you can assess as having that sort of uh, character? So, you know, look, am I here to blame you for, for the sort of the inadequacy of the capital markets? No, I'm not here to blame you for the inadequacy of Canada's capital, uh, private capital markets. I'm here to encourage you to work closely with the regulator. Obviously, the regulator has got to be part of this to do more with Canada's private capital markets, right? So that if we look at the S&P 500, you know, 10 years from now, there are actually, in the top 50, there are actually some Canadian companies that, that started in Canada in the course of the last five years that are still Canadian-owned and were supported and built by Canadian equity and, and Canadian capital. And that's the, uh, that's the opportunity, if you like, and, and it's, our, it's, our, it's our job, if you like, our, our, our mission, if you like, um, uh, to try to get there. So thanks for, thanks for this, and I'm happy to open the floor for a couple of questions if we've got time. So, th thank you. Any, any tough questions? Tougher the better. Just short of the answer, that's all. Mr. Risley. Yes, sir. You made a very interesting comment to me. Maybe it'll yeah, perfect. The superiority of the U.S. financial markets. Yep. Uh, and also the U.S. capital markets. Yep. Yeah, I, look, I, I think one of the, uh, so um, without disagreeing with anything you've said, I, I think we're all proud of the fact that, the, that Canada has got some great financial institutions and certainly having those during the course of 2008 and 2009 stood the country in great stead and, and I wouldn't be, so I'm not interested, frankly, in pulling down the banks and I'm not suggesting you are either, sir. My point is that there's opportunity around these big guys. They, they, they are big, and if I've learned one thing about big companies in my lifetime is that they move incredibly slowly. They're incredibly bureaucratic. They talk about innovation, but they don't understand what the word means because they're just not capable institutionally of innovating, right? Just not. No, but think about it. Think about, when, think about what innovation is. Innovation is, is trusting your gut, right? Innovation is not about having a business case in which you can present an ROI that somebody can do diligence, right? That's not innovation, uh, but that's how big companies uh, support capital investment, right? So an entrepreneur, entrepreneur believes that he can do something, and, and in fact, the business model very often follows the opportunity. It's not, can you imagine a big company investing in innovation in the absence of the business model? Never happening, right? So my point is that what Canadian capital markets can do around the banks is to develop real specialties. I mean, when somebody says, look, I'm, you know, I'm this and I do real estate and I do mining and I do biotech and I do this and I'm not being critical, I'm just using examples. And we essentially, they cover the spectrum, if you like, of virtually 80% of what's going on in industrial activity. My answer is good, you're expert in nothing. You've just told me you're an expert in nothing because you can't be an expert and do all these things, right? So if you go to uh, really smart, PE money in the United States and really smart VC money, you will find that they know a huge amount about the sector. They will be expert. You don't have to tell them who the players are. You don't have to tell them what the competing technologies are. They know. And so what they're doing is, is, is they are bringing their resources to bear. And we don't have that. I'm sorry. We don't have that in this country. I'm not saying there aren't some exceptions to that. I'm saying that's where the opportunity is. Next question, sir.
So, so let me answer your second question first. I'm not in favor of restricting somebody who's a fiduciary from who's, who's supposed to develop, do their best in terms of generating a return for, uh, for their um, uh, pension holders or whoever, whoever they are. I, I don't want any restrictions on them. If they want to buy an airport in New Zealand, let them go buy an airport in New Zealand. I have no problem with that, and I don't want to restrict them. I think that the way that Canadian industry is going to survive is to be truly competitive and to offer a, a reason why people should be investing here. Obviously, Canadian institutions should be investing here, but this, this is the point. This room has a collective responsibility to make sure that the opportunities that are resident in Canada come to the attention of the people who are buying the airports in New Zealand. Because I can tell you, they didn't find that opportunity on their own. A telephone rang one day from somebody in, the, in New York, right, who said, look, we want it, we're doing this deal, or we want you in, or this is an opportunity you should be looking at. That's how the airport in New Zealand happened, right? And so that's how the deals in Halifax and Calgary and British Columbia should happen, is that somebody in this room or your colleagues in this industry should be calling those people who are making those investments. And you're not. I'm not saying you're not. You are. I'm not saying you're not doing it to the extent that that, that potential exists. And it's not the fault of the big banks, and it's not the fault of the regulator, because those are things that you've got to work with or work around. Right? The same obstacles everybody else faces in business. Here's the problem with trying to sort of come at the income trust thing and sort of saying, because I'm with you, like it was, I, I mean, I promise you I had several meetings with the minister on this very subject. How about let's do in a cap of 250 or, you know, some number. So, okay, so then you take a company who, who is a billion dollars who wants to convert into income trust, so then they divide themselves up into four units, right? Or you got a guy that's $200 million, he, he grows through the $250 million threshold, goes on to become a $400 million business. So what happens to him? Has he got to convert? Um, you know, they're just, they're, they're problems, right? And the minister had thought through all these problems and had just decided, look, there's just too many loopholes here. I'm just gonna close it down, period. And, you know, right or wrong, and I'm not saying he was, he was, he was right to close it. I'm just saying, what a shame for our public capital markets because it was a real made in Canada deal that was working well for us, at least I thought it was working extremely well for us and it brought, it brought uh, money into the public markets which perhaps might not have otherwise come into our public markets and, and, and you know, obviously not every company succeeded but a lot of them did very well and investors did very well. So. Any other questions? Anyway, thank you for this opportunity, I appreciate it.